share is going to double because the transport energy is also going to increase quite significantly. Their actual uh, absolute you know, increase will be much higher than uh, doubling. But still, it's going to be about 10 percent by 2040, more like 10 percent. Why is that? They again start from a low base. There are significant barriers to unlimited and fast growth. Once again, they're generally relevant to light duty vehicles, many of them, you know, and that means commercial transport, which accounts for about 55% of, uh, you know, transport energy, won't benefit from this. A very good example is uh, uh, aviation. There's a lot of hype and talk about, you know, uh, biofuels for aviation, et cetera. It's not going to happen in any, you know, <laughs> any, in a hurry. Uh, so let's look at things like biofuels. They are made from, you know, sugar, starch, vegetable oils, and so on. Current share is around 2% of total transport energy demand. In the, you know, pr it's primarily ethanol. In this country, it's very big, ethanol. 10% of gasoline, uh, or 6.5% of, uh, uh, you know, light duty transport energy is from ethanol. And that is about 3% of total transport energy is from ethanol in this country, okay? Uh, what are the main drivers? Again, import substitution, security of supply. Many countries which import oil very dearly would like to stop importing oil. And they, they, are, they have spent a lot of effort in uh, uh, developing biofuels. Use of agricultural surplus, surpluses, bio waste man, management, and there was talk, I mean, this, there is a lot of revisionism around this now. There used to be, uh, there used to be, you know, belief that they are good for greenhouse gas emissions. But if you use, if you take into account land use changes, et cetera, most cases they are not good for greenhouse gases. But that doesn't mean that it will, you know, they will go away because these other things will make sure that, uh, you know, uh, they will be uh, there. And the big challenge is, which is why most environmentalists now are against biofuels, is the food versus fuel uh, uh, argument. I mean, about the availability of land, you know, whether you use it to grow food or grow fuel, for example. And the costs per unit of energy are still high. And these big issues about deforestation, water and fertilizer use have changed people's views about how sustainable biofuels are, basically. You know, uh, for example, in the U US, you know, 46% of corn production goes to make ethanol, okay? And uh, uh, even if all, you know, um, uh, actually, I, I don't want to go into this because it's there in the paper, but uh, let's, let's move on. Essentially, this is a big issue, okay? And there was a lot of talk in the past about second generation, even now, not in the past, second generation biofuels. In other words, using uh, biomaterial which is not used for food to make fuels, okay? Uh, however, the targets were set and they have spectacularly failed to meet the targets. For example, uh, actual production in the U US in 2015 was 2.2 million gallons of these uh, second generation biofuel. You know, the original requirement, RFS2, for 2015 was 3 billion gallons. Of, you know, and simply the technology hasn't developed. You know, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, of course, the US EPA keeps revising this downwards, and, but still, from 3 billion to 2.2 billion. So ba basically, the technology is not developed, and uh, this is why it is not happening. Natural gas, you know, is of course cheap and abundant. It's normally used for heating and electricity. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, it is not suitable for transport, mainly because it's, you know, of the, uh, I said 700, more 700 to 800 times, I think it is, depending on whether you compare it to diesel or gasoline, you know. Desirable properties are, it is very good as a combustion fuel, high octane, it will reduce particulates, lower CO2, et cetera, if you make sure that there is no uh, methane escape from the supply chain. Because methane is about 40 times worse than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. 
And in fact, if there is unburnt methane coming out from your combustion engine, it can more than cancel out the CO2 benefit you have in, when you consider greenhouse gas in, uh, emissions. You know? But it's very commonly used in, I mean, technology is very old and it's been used in, uh, um, uh, in 2012, there are about 17 million natural gas vehicles. But the share of the total transport energy is only 1%. Okay, why is that so? Because of the infrastructure issues associated with that. Initial cost is high, uh, the, the driving range is low, there are issues with safety and environment, you know. Uh, and, you know, but there is a lot of interest in this, mainly in this country because of uh, shale gas, which is cheap, and, uh, 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 but it's much more suited to heavy duty fleets and you know, liquid nitrogen gas for, uh, uh, for m marine applications. And the share is expected to increase from 1% to about 5% in some projections. But it depends on the oil price. I, I, I won't go into any more detail. But it's still expected to increase by a very significant amount. But it still be only 5% of the total transport energy. Uh, other alternatives like liquid petroleum gas, DME, methanol, and so on, they all have their niche. But methanol is a very interesting uh, future fuel. Uh, it can be made very cheaply from all kinds of things, mainly from coal. And therefore, there's tremendous interest in methanol in, in, in India at the moment, and China, of course. China is also uses, uses a lot of methanol. You know. It's not very good, I mean, since you're using coal, it's not very good for greenhouse gases, but it's very good from the energy security point of view for, for these countries. And so India is really looking at methanol for transport because they want to be energy independent, you know. Uh, and other things like made from uh, synthetic fuels like GTL, you know, et cetera, are not, they're very, very expensive to make, and they're not likely to be very big. Uh, role there in transport fuels, basically. Use of such, any of these fuels and uh, ethanol and everything else always makes some sense somewhere, sometime, okay? But they're not universal solutions to uh, transport. And they will be, uh, they will continue to be used as uh, niche fuels. And some like methanol, in my opinion, will find increasing use in some countries. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Of course, the other alternative, which is talked about, I mean, it was very common, especially in this country, and the, I mean, a very big thing uh, under the Bush administration was hydrogen, uh, uh, you know. But hydrogen is very badly suited for transportation because it's like electricity, it's an energy carrier, you know, it needs to be manufactured. Production is extremely energy in intensive, uh, but, it can be produced from all kinds of things, natural gas, coal, and so on. Uh, but if you use that, it produces CO2. Uh, electrolysis of water, again, using electricity from renewables is very good. But, you know, if you use uh, coal-based electricity for that, it's much worse than, uh, you know, uh, internal combustion engines. But essentially, hydrogen production must use CO2-free primary energy if CO2 mitigation is a concern, okay? And there is this question, I mean, this is what actually, I, one thing I agree with Elon Musk about, if you have uh, renewable energy, electricity, why convert it into hydrogen? You might as well use it in, to drive electric vehicles, you know? Uh, because uh, there'll be a much greater reduction in CO2 if renewable energy is used to replace, in fact, instead of using in transport, if you just used it to replace coal-based electricity generation, for example, you know. But you have to have enough renewable hydrogen for that. I mean, hydrogen made from renewable energy. Uh, storage and transport is very, very difficult. You know, liquid hydrogen, even liquid hydrogen is five times lower in uh, volumetric energy density compared to gasoline. Compression and liquefaction will use huge amounts of energy. 40% of energy will be lost if you liquefy uh, hydrogen. And extensive infrastructure investment is needed. I mean, the costs of such investment are trillions of dollars, you know, uh, 
uh, that's ex expected. So it's actually not a viable transport fuel for next few decades. Uh, those who were here yesterday, as uh, um, Rolf Reitz was saying, you might think of it as a future fuel in 100 years' time or 200 years' time or something when you've solved all these problems. But till these problems are solved, it is not uh, uh, you know, um, a viable transport fuel. Even, if, even uh, viable energy. Uh, but it has some niche potential, some places where you, for example, as uh, the sh share of renewables increases in electricity generation, you will have a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy which has no use because it will come when you don't need it. You, know? you can then convert it into uh, hydrogen, and this is a way of storing uh, unwanted renewable energy. And then you can use it for all kinds of things. Whether you use, use it for transport or not is another matter. Okay? Right. So even in 2040, 90% of transport energy is expected to come from, this is again a projection based from, on petroleum-based fuels powering internal combustion engines. And therefore, it is absolutely important to improve such systems in order to uh, maintain the sustain sustainability of transport, okay? So how do we do this? Uh, uh, well, uh, you can say in conventional, uh, in stage one, you use conventional engines using known fuels like gasoline, diesel, and which is what we are talking about. How do we improve the efficiency of uh, current engines, you know? Uh, and uh, 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 better combustion control after treatment coupled with partial electrification will deliver huge benefits. I mean, uh, some estimates say for spark ignition engines, you could easily improve the efficiency by, uh, by 50% more than what it is. From going from, say, 25%, uh, you know, brake thermal efficiency to maybe 45%, you know, you know, with a combination of these kinds of technologies. Then in stage two, which is the next generation, you, somebody asked me about GCI. I mean, this is the kind of thing that we are talking about. In the next generation, you use fuel engine system, you develop fuel engine systems to make the best use of fuels as well as the engines. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and also unconventional engine system like the opposed piston, Akatis engine, and so on, uh, by using when you say new fuels, fuels which are not in the market at the moment, because they don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, satisfy existing specifications, they will offer much more flexibility and will help mitigate the future supply and demand issues as well. And we'll discuss this again uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and the stage three is the longer term that I was just mentioning. For example, if if the whole energy system is decarbonized, you know, at some stage in the far future. Uh, increasing role, I mean, I, and if battery technology develops even further, there'll be definitely increasing role for battery electric vehicles. And hydrogen will come into the picture then, okay? But when you look at these changes, you must assess these changes based on uh, at least life cycle, I mean, uh, well-to-wheel analysis, or in fact, even better is to cr cradle to gray, gray basis, in a sense, uh, from production to final disposal of batteries, for example, you know. Uh, though, uh, I mean, because otherwise, you'll end up with very bad policy decisions. I mean, in fact, with, I mean, as we discussed with the electric vehicles, you can simply shift the environmental burden from the tailpipe to somewhere else, and it could be much worse overall. You know, if you don't do this like this. But there are some cases where these changes may be forced for other uh, reasons, you know, as we discussed, energy security or uh, whatever. Right. <clears throat> and I'll talk about this tomorrow. Gasoline compression ignition is an example of fuel engine system development. I mean, we will not uh, go through this. And the summary is, the global transport energy demand is large and increasing. There are different motivations for change. All alternatives start from a very low base, are costly, inconvenient, and cannot grow without restraint, I mean, without constraint, and cannot grow fast. And this is the reason why, even by 2040, most of transport energy will come from petroleum-based fuels, 
powering internal combustion engines. And alternatives need to be uh, assessed on a life cycle basis. And these impacts of transport can be reduced really only by improving uh, internal combustion engines. You know, uh, and this is another important point we have to remember. More diesel and jet fuel will be needed uh, uh, compared to gasoline. Uh, and this is a great challenge for ref the refining industry, which will produce low octane gasoline in surplus. surplus. And you have to develop you know, new engine systems which can use this effectively. And we'll talk about this tomorrow. Because that will help the overall sustainability of the transport system. You know, uh, for that to happen, there has to be a lot of collaboration between all stakeholders, auto companies, you know, fuel companies, governments, and so on. And uh, uh, this will eventually happen, in my opinion. OK? This is uh, actually it took <laughs> longer than I expected for the first uh, two uh, lectures. But are there any questions that you want to raise and discuss? Yeah. Yeah, that, that is exactly what is done. I mean, when you do life cycle analysis, that's exactly what you do. So you look at the production aspects of all. I mean, uh, there are, uh, as I said, in this paper, there are many references which look at this, OK? And uh, uh, on that basis, you find that the, uh, the, what sometimes they call them embedded CO2 emissions. I mean, in the sense, they, these are to do with, they are significantly higher for battery electric vehicles. And it's mostly to do with uh, production of batteries, not the rest of the vehicle. Yeah, it's uh, applied energy, uh, uh, volume 225, 2018 page 965 to 974. And the title is, Is it really the end of internal combustion engines and petroleum in transport? OK? You pr probably, if you Google it, you'll find, uh, actually, I should have put this on the, I forgot to put the, I don't know whether I did, actually. Hold on, right on the first page. No, I don't have it. Yeah, OK. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, I mean, you, you'll find a lot of references in that paper which look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is one of the biggest issues for bringing hydrogen into the transport sector. And there, is, there was a lot of, but you see, the point is, now, as fashions change, you know, uh, it has, I mean, there's not as much research being done. In the, but there's a lot of research was done in this, I mean, in terms of, and I don't know that there are, there's any viable system yet. I mean, though, of course, you remember, Toyota actually have a, a fuel cell vehicle running on hydrogen, the Mirai, for instance. It's sold for $75,000, but it's probably cost $150,000 in total. But, you know, this is a, uh, but, but there it's, I think, is a pressurized system, you know. Uh, we, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if on the other hand suddenly, uh, you know, fuel cells become, cheap and you solve all the problems associated with them, then there might be another reason why hydrogen, you have to solve these problems associated with hydrogen, okay? And quite often this is what happens with, uh, uh, you know, I showed that Vaslav Smell's picture about coal and so on. It is sometimes what drives the energy systems is new technology which can use that, I mean, as I said with coal, it was the steam engine. 
with the oil, it was the uh, internal combustion engine. So for some reason they take hold and they, are, they make sense, you know, then that kind of technology will develop and it'll, uh, 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 that kind of fuel will develop and all the uh, problems associated with will, will have to be solved. Right? Okay, now let me go to the next talk, which is uh, a little bit, uh, hold on, where is it? This is a very basic, quick run through fuel properties and so on. By the way, there I have most of these things are based on my book. I mean, uh, which is uh, which is uh, called Fuel Engine Interactions. SAE have published this. What's happening here? Right. <clears throat> it's in uh, chapter two, basically. And also, another good resource uh, is uh, this, again, an SAE paper called uh, Automotive Fuels Reference Book. Okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, we have already gone through this. Current IC engines, their spark ignition engines use gasoline, their light duty compression ignition engines are essentially diesel engines, they use diesel fuel. Uh, mostly heavy duty. Uh, CI engines are more efficient, but more expensive. Uh, and in terms of current fuels, gasoline and diesel are the main fuels uh, for road and marine transport, you know, uh, you know uh, land and marine transport, uh, whereas jet fuel is used in uh, aviation. Uh, and uh, the, in terms of these fuels, the primary fuel property is the auto ignition quality, uh, gasolines have to be resistant to auto, and we'll talk about this much more tomorrow, by the way. Uh, 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 they're measured by octane numbers and so on. And diesel fuels have to be, you know, uh, auto-ignite easily, and they are used in diesel engines. Diesels are also less volatile and heavier. You know, jet fuel is like a lighter diesel, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Now, fuels have developed along with engines. I mean, with, if you look at those properties. You know, at the start of the 20th century, only fuels that were available were light fractions from distance. So you basically, you boiled oil and took whatever came out of it, you know, and used it in engines. As engine de de designers sought to improve efficiency, knock became a big factor in spark ignition engines. And initially, fuel quality was improved by adding things like aromatics, produced by distillation of coal. I mean, people just, people didn't understand what was causing knock and how, you, but they knew from experience and, ex, you know, empirical experience that you could add things like aromatics to uh, improve uh, knock resistance. Lead additives were discovered in 1921. Now, funnily enough, there was great resistance initially because of concerns about toxicity for lead, towards lead additives. And then, because the imperative was so high to get better engines, it became very commonly used. Now, eventually, the, exactly the same reason you have to take uh, lead out, okay? 1929, the octane scale and the octane numbers were invented, uh, you know. And there are continuous improvements in the refinery pr process to improve anti-knock quality, and we'll talk about it, I keep saying, tomorrow. Uh, and emission concerns and fuels uh, became, uh, to enable after treatment technologies from 1970 onwards became very important. That means lead had to be removed, uh, apart from this issue, because they, uh, it, there was it would poison catalyst. Reduction in sulfur is another big change that has happened because of uh, uh, changes in engine technology. And if you look at diesels, uh, they have also developed along with engines. Uh, Rudolf Diesel, actually, he had envisaged 
that the, his engine could run on many different fuels, low-grade oil from bituminous coal, coal, light crude, anything, basically. He would, you know, uh, and uh, the, during the course of the century, high viscosities and deposit forming properties were improved. Ignition quality is improved. Low temperature performance became very important. There was a very extreme winter in Europe in 1962 and 1963, uh, and uh, that basically, uh, essentially, diesel froze. I mean, fr diesel froze inside. Diesel contains a lot of uh, paraffinic, I mean, uh, components, and they just become waxes at 100 temperature, and that means diesel can't flow, you know, and this, uh, low temperature performance then became important, and in recent times, of course, sulfur have been, has been reduced very significantly in diesel uh, fuels. So, I, I mentioned how fuels are manufactured. I mean, this is a very quick, you know, and dirty outline, okay? Uh, as I said, most transport fuels are made from refineries starting with crude oil, and it is separated into different boiling ranges in uh, these um, fractionation columns, I mean, in, uh, in the distillation columns. Uh, and after distillation, initial distillation, 40 to 60% of it is left behind as basically solid because its uh, boiling point is greater than 380 centigrade. And in fact, the refineries have to basically do a lot of things to make use of this. And so they do thermal cracking, uh, to, uh, and then, even with the distillates, they, there's a lot of different uh, processes to change the composition, redistribution of carbon and hydrogen ratio, removal of contaminants like sulfur and other metals, you know. Uh, and then, fuel, fuels are blended from different components that come from this. And of course, other sources like we mentioned, ethanol, MTB, and other fuel components. And uh, you know, they're blended to meet certain specifications in each country, you know. Uh, and refineries also, of course, supply feedstock to the chemical industry because many of the refinery products, 40%, not 40%, maybe 30% of the refinery products go into the chemical industry to make petro, uh, petrochemicals uh, like plastics and so on. So when you first boil the uh, crude oil, First thing that comes out is liquid petroleum gas. It may mostly contains uh, uh, propane, but there's also butane in this. The next level is uh, uh, gasoline. G gasoline and, uh, I mean, in, so, uh, and, and anything in the gasoline boiling range, which is between 200 and uh, 30 degrees centigrade, basically, I mean, you know, is generically known as naphtha in the, uh, you know. So, uh, it can come from, most of it comes from the initial distillation, but it can come from all kinds of other processes in the refinery. So anything in the gasoline boiling range is called naphtha, but mostly it is not usable in fuel, uh, as a fuel because it's very low octane, so it has to be upgraded, you know. Then these things in the diesel boiling range between, say, um, 100, um, uh, 100, 60 to 360 uh, is, uh, you know, uh, they're called dist middle distillates. So this is diesel and jet fuel. Uh, jet fuel is basically kerosene, which is like a light di diesel, I mean, a lighter fraction of the diesel, basically. Then you have uh, residual fuels, uh, l lubricants, lube oils, which are used to make lubricants. And then you have bitumen, you know, and there are other really heavy materials, but bitumen is the kind of thing that needs to be cracked to make. So you need to bring that boiling range down to somewhere here in order to uh, make more fuels. Otherwise, basically, the whole thing will not be sustainable. You have to make use of uh, these heavy materials. And there is, depending on uh, uh, you know, what, I mean, you see, the crude oils vary a lot across the world. I mean, you know, uh, uh, these are the different properties of crude oils. And depending on the crude oils, what you get, for example, the Venezuelan crude oil is very heavy, and there is a lot of residual, I mean, you know, uh, heavy much, uh, uh, 
material which needs to be cracked. Whereas North Sea oil is much lighter and it can produce a lot of uh, um, uh, naphtha and uh, kerosene and diesel, you know, compared to the Venezuelan. Island. So refineries have to really be, um, in fact, modern refineries now are much more ag agile because uh, they, they try to find the cheapest crude and change their operating procedures to make use of the cheapest crude, basically. But it, it requires a lot of technology, generally speaking. And in terms of prices, uh, uh, you know, uh, the heavier materials are less expensive or less valuable, let's put it this way. And in fact, gasoline is actually, nowadays actually, it is, uh, low sulfur diesel is the most expensive thing that you can get in the, uh, at refinery prices. But what you pay the pump depends very much on the taxation policies of the government itself, okay? So what, what, the, what goes out of the refinery in terms of prices is not exactly reflected in what, what you pay at the pump. Uh, and essentially, as I said, you from crude oil, you make all these things, and then, uh, <clears throat> but the demand is something, uh, this, is my, this, is my, this is what you might come out, you know, in your refinery, uh, but this is what the, uh, what the demand might be. And so there are many, many different uh, processes that you have to use to make the fuels that are actually needed in the market, okay? I won't go into the details. Uh, and this is, uh, there are, this is a s typical refinery flow scheme, which uh, they can be simple uh, refineries and complex refineries which have all kinds of other things. I mean, let's not go into the detail. I mean, it's, it's too much to explain. Uh, and the typical use uh, yield structure depends on how complex the refinery is. For, for example, a fully complex re refinery with uh, a uh, cat cracker unit and uh, um, a hydro cracker unit and so on will produce a lot more valuable products. I mean, you know, in for example, uh, it will produce 40%, I mean, with the hydro cracker unit, it will produce 40% low sulfur diesel, you know, as opposed to simple distillation will, will only give you 25% uh, diesel. Uh, and uh, in terms of gasoline, for example, you know, it'll produce, uh, this will, simple distillation will not produce any gasoline, whereas you'll get about 20, you know, 20, 30%. So it depends on how the refinery, uh, uh, how complex the, what the technology is in the refinery, okay? And then, as I said, you have to blend these various components along with other things like MTB or ethanol or so on to meet, uh, uh, for example, the uh, initial um, uh, NAFTA that comes in could be between 60 and 75 uh, octane number. And you want something, uh, you know, which is, uh, um, uh, what, 91 octane. So you need to blend these various things to meet specifications. Uh, and uh, in terms of gasoline blending, it's a very sophisticated process because you have to meet not only things like octane numbers, but also uh, uh, octane numbers here, but also the volatility uh, characteristics. I mean, we'll come to that in a minute. So, uh, you know, there are lots of conflicting requirements which have to be met before the fuel is ready for the market. So, what are the fuel properties that are typically important? You know, in outline. So, firstly, what does the gasoline or diesel consist of? It's a complex mix mixture of hydrocarbons. There are literally thousands of hydrocarbons you can uh, identify, I mean, if you go deep enough. But in general, there are alkanes and paraffins, olefins, naphthenes, aromatics, oxygenates, sulfur compounds, and then you usually add additives to this to uh, make the fuel uh, fit for the market. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, these are um, I, basically saying the same thing that I said before. Uh, and what, there are effects of gasoline, comp you know, the gasoline composition has an if, uh, 
effect on our engine performance. For example, sulfur has an ad adverse effect on catalysts in both spark ignition and diesel engines. Uh, aromatics have high antinoc quality in uh, SI engines, but benzene is bad, you know, so uh, NOx and particulates in diesel engines uh, increase as aromatics go. The reason I'm pointing this out is many of the properties that are, or the specifications, there is some logic behind it, why specifications are set. Because there are some effects of the uh, uh, fuel composition, you know, uh, on engine performance or emissions and so on, therefore they are uh, controlled. Uh, now take gasoline volatility, for instance. If you, uh, this is, by the way, gasoline, uh, the ASTM D81 test is the oldest fuel test uh, uh, that was established, in fact, even before the, I think, the octane test. And what you do is you actually basically boil the fuel and see what fraction of the fuel comes out in what temperature range, you know. And uh, you can see that it could be li uh, so, uh, something like this in a uh, gasoline. And uh, the, fuel, uh, the fuel components in this range are important for cold start and uh, hot, you know, hot fuel handling. Uh, this will affect icing and uh, warm up acceleration. I mean, icing actually is not an issue now. It, it, this used to be in the carburetor era, you know. Uh, but, and there, here, uh, the heavy ends basically have an impact on fuel economy and uh, cleanliness and so on. And this is why they are, there are volatility uh, specifications on gasoline, for example. And there are different ways of expressing volatility. I won't go into this detail. Uh, and the other important point is vapor pressure, for example. You know, uh, uh, because in modern engines, vapor pressure will affect hydrocarbon emissions uh, you know, when the, in, the car is just standing, basically, evaporative emissions, you know. Uh, and also, it is important, uh, uh, yeah, again, this is not relevant in modern fuels, but, uh, modern engines, by the way. This vapor lock used to, it can occur in uh, inject, you know, fuel injection systems as well. If the fuel is very light and the uh, temperature goes up. I mean, you, you just, it'll boil locally and it'll, you know, uh, produce gas which will lock up the uh, injection system. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at lower temperature, uh, at lower ambient temperatures, high vapor pressure is needed to allow ease of starting. In a high vapor pressure and volatility are in some way related, I mean, in a complex way, but uh, essentially uh, for cold start, you need uh, volatile components in the uh, gasoline, which allows you to mix, the, you know, uh, start the engine. Uh, and uh, the uh, heavy uh, components are important, as I said, uh, in order to increase the density, increase the volumetric uh, uh, um, energy content, and therefore, uh, um, you know, improves fuel economy potential. Uh, and gasoline volatility, warm up and, you know, cold drivability, for example, these were, once again, you know, these, many of these specifications were set uh, many years, some of them decades ago, but engine technology has moved on now. And many of the things uh, which, uh, uh, for example, in port fuel injectors, uh, port fuel injected engines, uh, which is the previous generation engines, if you will, uh, drivability is affected by volatility, but modern DISI engines don't have, you know, they can, uh, they can take this variations in volatility much more easily, okay? But there are, there are new issues associated with, uh, with drivability. Somebody asked me about uh, particulates, you, you were talking about, in, in, uh, if, if the fuel is not volatile enough, you can produce you know, in DISA engines, because the mixing is not very good, uh, you can produce, it has an impact on particulates, for example. So those, many of these uh, specifications which were set, properties which were set for some other reason in the past are also important in new engines as technology develops, but you need to understand this. So it is a, 
uh, then of course there is the question of knock, which we'll talk we'll talk about uh, uh, um, tomorrow. Knock is the single most important fuel property for gasoline, because knock limits efficiency in engines, spark ignition engines, and uh, more or less all of fuel manufacture is built around meeting uh, uh, knock requirements and you know, anti-knock requirements of the fuel. So it is the, it's the most important property for gasoline. Uh, when I say knock is important, no, not just for gasoline manufacture, but it impacts, if you saw the uh, complexity of the refinery I showed you, it impacts all fuel manufacture, depending on wh what the knock specifications are. And it can, in the worst case, cause real damage to the engine. But it is a, now modern engines don't. We will talk about this tomorrow. And gasoline octane again. We'll talk about it tomorrow. It is the uh, is the most important property, as I said, and it is measured. Remember, on a test method that was developed in 1929. Okay, uh, and it doesn't matter, but uh, you know, but it still is the most commonly used. Uh, not the only way knock anti knock quality is specified. Okay, uh, so we will we'll skip this. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, and gasoline quality. There was a, a huge um, uh, study. Um, many, in fact, in Japan, in the U.S., and uh, in, even in Europe, where. There are big cooperative studies between the auto and oil industries to understand the impact of fuel composition on emissions in the 90s, 1990s. Okay, uh, and uh, to reduce hydrocarbons, the general thing was we should reduce, uh, uh, you know, RVP. I mentioned the evaporative emissions before. They, they shouldn't be too volatile. In other words, the fuel should not be too volatile. Uh, you have to reduce aromatic content, uh, add oxygenates. These are generic, uh, you know, results that came out. Some of them are more robust than others, but they informed the, uh, you know, um, uh, fuel, how fuel specifications were set. Uh, again, reducing aromatics was considered important. Uh, reducing sulfur. In fact, of all these studies, the most uh, robust conclusion that came out was that you must reduce sulfur in, in order to uh, reduce emissions in mo uh, modern cars. All these others are very questionable. I mean, there are, you know, it depends on the engine technology and how, and, and the, also the effects are quite, not, quite small. But sulfur, there is no, uh, uh, no doubt at all, you know. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> then there are, um, Questions about engine deposits, how fuels affect me, which is, I'll talk in a minute, I mean, after I finish this uh, bit. Uh, and uh, similarly, diesel fuel, fuel properties and their effects, CTA number, I mentioned earlier, I mean, it's the uh, auto ignition quality of the diesel fuel, density, sulfur, aromatics, they all have some impact on en engine performance uh, and uh, emissions. And things like foaming, are also important because when you are filling up your uh, tank, if the fuel foams, I mean, it can be very bad. I mean, it can spill out of your car and, and so on. So there are, uh, you know, it's, uh, risks, there are specification associated with that. Uh, again, inj injector deposits, we, we'll talk about in a minute. So fuel specifications are there in, uh, because they define some fuel quality, okay? Uh, it is defined by selected properties and composition, and these criteria for measuring these properties are standardized and harmonized across the industry. And this is, and this is what I, I said right at the outset, that mm, fuel companies spend huge amounts of money on these kinds of things. You know, because this is what matters, I mean, in the market, fuel quality. And specifications actually require that a given fuel property must fall within a certain range 
uh, fuel property that's measured according to the standardized methods falls within certain pre uh, I mean. Why is that so? To ensure that engines operate smoothly, cleanly, and with no harm. There shouldn't be any long-term harm. And these are agreed initially by oil and auto industries, generally speaking. And then the uh, authorities in each country, I mean the governments, will actually make them legally binding. So in quite often, not quite often, it's usually uh, not allowed lawfully to sell fuels which are not meeting the specification. So specifications are very, very important uh, because they affect how fuels are manufactured. And they're not necessarily, by the way, uh, sensible. Sometimes, because as I said, many of the time, I mean, you know, my specification was set many years ago, and they're not relevant to modern engines. And some of them are actually uh, in making fuels grow in exactly the opposite direction to what modern, where modern engines are heading. And I'll talk about this tomorrow in terms of octane quality. But they are there, and you have to meet them, OK? Uh, and there are other uh, pressures. I mean, uh, but essentially, it's the legal specification that matter. But uh, many auto companies came together, and pr they produced this worldwide fuels charter, which is their like, desirable fuel quality. And they have a whole range of uh, re requirements. And uh, some examples are here, for example. You know, what are the kind of fuels? Pr for example, the raw research octane number, motor octane number, sulfur, benzene, aromatic. They are all specified. I mean, to be within a certain. So, uh, gasoline in uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of Europe must meet this specification. Otherwise, it can't be sold. Basically, you know. Uh, and uh, similarly, there are specifications for diesel. I mean, there are many. Pro these are the common properties that are to be met, basically. But, I mean, if you look at the ASDM property, there are many, many, many more properties that you can measure. And, uh, you know, things like appearance, for example, you know, why we, there, there is a specification that has to be met. But some of them are uh, injector cleanliness methods and so on. They, some of them are not mandatory. But, uh, you know, oil companies and fuel suppliers use them to differentiate their uh, fuels. Okay? See, this another page of uh, uh, fuel properties for diesel, you know. And basically, advances in one fuels must use the existing technology of the other. So it's always a chicken. This is why it's very difficult to change. Even though, as I said, some specifications are not sensible, it is almost impossible to change them because they are there, you know, and uh, uh, the, all the manufacturing is based on that, you know. Uh, but actually, the best performance and efficiency will come from optimization of the engine and the fuels together. And we'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow. Uh, I mean, in terms of gasoline um, uh, composition, benzene, total aromatics, and olefins are uh, specified, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, less, yeah, there are, diff there are agreed methods on which you can, uh, let's not go into this. I mean, there are many, uh, and this is the kind of summary I already showed you. I mean, this is uh, the kind of thing that one has to meet. Uh, right, uh, I think this is, this is enough here, okay? Uh, any questions on this? No? Let Mm -hmm. Maritime, yeah, yeah, that's true, yes. Another one is hmm. Well, yes, that is a big issue. It's still not clear how it's going to be handled, you know, whether the uh, uh, fuel companies will reduce. Essentially, what this will mean is instead of using, uh, you know, HVO, high viscosity.
in, in uh, marine, they might have to move, move to uh, low sulfur diesel. Okay. Well, I mean, the technology, of course, exists, but it will make the whole, I mean, the fuel system, I mean, fuel is extremely expensive for marine fuel. I mean, this is what I'm saying. So, in fact, this is another impact, by the way. If marine uh, application moves from uh, um, conventional marine fuel to low sulfur diesel, you know, I mentioned diesel demand is going up, diesel and that will add even more to the diesel demand going up, okay? And so this will have a, another impact on uh, the supply demand situation. But uh, uh, this is coming and uh, it's, I don't know how it's going to be resolved. I mean, uh, because there is talk about uh, marine engines being modified to, by putting scrubbers, you know, uh, uh, on, on board, but of course, and how will they monitor it? How will they impose those restrictions? And, and you know, uh, ship owners absolutely don't want to do this because it will increase the cost. So somebody has to eventually pay. Anything else? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. You don't. I mean, you have to just, uh, uh, you have to make fuels which are, meet the existing specifications. As we'll, we'll talk about octane tomorrow, for example. You know, as uh, we now know that modern spark ignition engines, for a given RON, lower MON is better for thermodynamic and uh, chemical kinetic reasons. We now understand why this should be so. But in many countries, including in this country, uh, fuel specifications for anti knock quality are assume that high MON motor octane number is good. Okay? So essentially, it's exactly the opposite to what modern engines require. But there is a huge I mean, you know, inertia in terms of changing the kinds of technologies. You know, uh, aromatics, for instance, aromatic levels, you know. They were set, set, I mean, I showed you because, you know, in some types of engines, they can produce deposits and so on. But aromatics also bring in high anti knock quality. So if you restrict, I mean, most specifications restrict, I mean, uh, European and US specifications restrict aromatics to 35%. Now, the question is modern engines, you know, with modern anti, uh, after treatment system, don't really care whether it's 35% aromatics or 45% aromatics, okay? Because the exhaust emissions are taken care of, you know, by the, but you can't add, so by putting it 35%, it means it's much more difficult to get high anti knock quality, which is important for efficiency, you know? So there are lots of little things like that. I mean, about, uh, uh, gum specification, which restrict uh, putting in de uh, detergent additives, which are very essential, for example. Uh, but this is what it is. You have to live with it. What is that? The leakage of. Uh. Uh, well, I mean, in fact, I don't know what he said, but you know, in fact, when in the 1929, when the octane test was in, uh, invented, uh, the octane number of the gasoline available was like 60 ron. It has now gone to 90, 95 ron, right? And the auto companies want to increase it even further, but. Actually, without, if you can do the same thing by reducing MON, I mean, which means you have to change the fuel composition mm, as well. And uh, uh, 
Well, I, I don't know actually what Rolf was talking about, but uh, um, in, in general, uh, octane is a very important uh, issue. And we'll talk, it has a big impact on other things like um, uh, pre ignition, uh, 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 super knock and pre ignition, uh, which we'll talk about tomorrow as well. Well, uh, eventually, it is. They, these are legally they legal requirements. The government actually sets up, you know, some somebody in the government which is responsible for. In the EU, it's the European Union uh, law, which uh, sets up these specifications. But these specifications are agreed. I mean, there are usually lots of committees between. Uh, uh, sometimes auto and oil industries, I mean, in fact, usually auto and oil industries come together. Uh, he, in this country, the CRC, uh, the Cooperative Research Council, does a lot of work together, like, which is a body where uh, auto and oil companies come together and they discuss any of these things, uh, you know. And in fact, in the, at the moment, uh, the, in the US, there is a discussion going on about changing octane quality, uh, octane specification in the way I, I talked about. Uh, yeah, that's how it's done. There's a lot of very boring committee work, <laughs> literally. I mean, if you sit through one of those, yeah, yeah. Right? Do we take a break now or? Right, another 15 minutes? Right.